Um, so th this was born out of um, just waiting a week to see what happened with uh, when the, the pandemic struck a few weeks ago, I guess it was. So a lot of people kind of jumped in right away and hopped on the remote working train. And then uh, I thought, you know, what could be, what do people actually need help with? Um, and, you know, it's not limited to uh, change management or lean change or anything like that. It was basically um, like my wife's a Zumba fitness instructor. So a lot of them are independents. So their income went from something to zero. It's just binary because everything's shut down and they can't do anymore. So uh, we started streaming them through Zoom and then that led to a webinar. We showed um, a bunch of other independents how to actually do it. So we just did a little training webinar to show them how to use Zoom and how to set up the audio so it's not, you know, if you play something through your phone through the computer microphone, it's going to sound like crap. So how do you pipe your audio right through Zoom, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we've done support for some of them as well, so they can offer the uh, offer the classes at home and things like that. So I thought, well, it's probably lots of people that either can offer other people help, entrepreneurs, contractors, self-employed people to either figure out how to move their businesses online or to help them keep income coming in. Um, and there's probably people that actually want help and they don't know who to go to, where to ask or whatever. So this could be kind of like a matchmaking service. Um, you might find somebody in, you know, France that has an idea that you want to connect and chat with them. So it's kind of like just creating a forum for people to connect uh, and hang out, share some, some, some tips for how they're coping with this and whatever happens happens. Um, I think last week uh, uh, I set up a Trello board with just a list of um, actions and things that came out that are something that I could uh, do. So I'm working on a couple of short tutorial videos for how to do big Zoom meetings and how to use, how to do lean coffee online and stuff like that. And it'll all be free uh, on the YouTube channel as well. So, um, so from there, I think if, so if it's just the five of us, then we can just do informal conversation. So who, the first one we did was basically who you are, where you're from, which we kind of did with the four of us. Uh, and how is it going for you? Any Sorry, I. Oh, did did you speak to me? Because I just I just put a, I just found my headphones. Uh, oh no! And I got the feeling you were maybe asking me something because nobody was speaking. Uh, okay, I uh, know we basically just okay. uh, like the four of us joined a little bit early, so we already introduced ourselves to each other okay. a little bit. So I guess if you wanted to start, uh, Sonia, you can go ahead. So we yeah. we were just uh, asking who you are, where you're from, what you do, and how are things going for you in this, uh, in this new Strange. world? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, situation. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, I'm Sonia. I'm from Berlin, working for a, a governmental company, and I'm responsible for process and quality management there. So interested in, in learning a few things about, uh, your approach and um, I'm well dealing quite okay with everything for the moment. We're all working remote and yeah, I'm enjoying home office actually and enjoying having video conferences with all kinds of people, <laughs> which I find also fun. Cool. Awesome. So my name is Sven. Uh, I'm also from Germany. I'm, uh, as I said, I'm from Frankfurt. I work in the pharmaceutical um, area, so I work for a big French pharmaceutical company called Sanofi, and um, I used Lean Coffee now a couple of times, uh, running a couple of uh, change management workshops, and i really a big fan of Lean Coffee now, and I try to promote it in, in our company as much as I can. Very cool. In, in person and remote, or are they all in person? Um, uh, yeah, well, before the corona, uh, we did it in person for sure. And now I'm, I'm curious to know how to run this uh, virtually, so to say, um, because I want to further promote it. Okay. And uh, I I'm, I'm, yeah, just want to know and, uh, how we can, can do it, at least in this kind of way. So that's the reason why I um, try to, to, to be here today. Okay, awesome. 
Thank you. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Once again, I'm Antonio. I'm from Brazil. And I spent, I guess, one year and a half delivering uh, lean change management workshops. Now I switched to another company. I'm working as Agile Code. And then I don't run workshops anymore. I'm just like an internal consultant for the company. But I'm here today because I want to get some ideas to run community practice or link talks in my company. And I don't know how to deal with that virtually. So it's going to be a new challenge for me. All right. I, I can go next. Um, my name is Laurel Benson. I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And um, I, my practice is organizational change management. That's what I've done for about the last 10 or 11 years. Um, I've worked in a number, well, I shouldn't say a number of industries. Obviously, oil and gas is a big one out here. Um, I've also worked in financial services. And it's interesting, my um, experience with the, the bank that I worked with, they were very well set up to work remotely. They had many years ago established a work from anywhere kind of approach. And um, they, so I'm sure they manage, are managing this just fine. Um, my current contract with a large oil and gas company here in Canada um, showed me that what it's like to work with a company that really had to be nimble and agile and work fast to support a large uh, workforce to start working remotely where they could. And then of course, where they can't, um, obviously some production elements of oil and gas can never be done remotely. Um, although they do have autonomous haul trucks, um, which are unmanned um, trucks, those really large vehicles, um, are, uh, are run autonomously. So they do have elements where they've incorporated uh, AI into their work and, and um, that's probably to their benefit. But I, what I saw was they had to work very, very fast to get online um, to support a large workforce to very suddenly, like basically overnight work remotely. Um, I've also seen the importance of communication during this time and they've done a phenomenal job right from their ceo of keeping the the workforce um informed calm uh clear on expectations um i went into the office this weekend and they took my temperature before i could go up to the office so they've incorporated some practices really really quickly to um to do the right thing for their employees um, and in Calgary here, uh, there's a daycare. So one of the first COVID cases in Canada, certainly in Alberta, was a child who was at the daycare of this company. So, um, so and then I found out I sat next to a woman who has two kids in that daycare. <laughs> so, so it's amazing how quickly you can realize like you're not that far separated from potential risk of it. Um, and then the reason I'm here is, uh, so I've actually, my contract with this company will be ending next week. And, uh, and I totally understand why it's a tough place. And as a contractor, you're, you're the first to go as you should be. Um, and so, but I, but on the bigger picture, I'm kind of more intrigued to start brainstorming with people. What are the opportunities that this this um, change, right? This shift in the way the world is working and thinking. What are the opportunities this presents to humanity um, to do things better? All right, cool. Uh, so Yvonne, we were just going around the, the virtual room. Everyone was introducing themselves, who they are, where they're from, and um, why, uh, why they chose to join today. Oh, hello, everybody. Um, apologies for joining late. And uh, I just had another meeting and it ended early. So thankfully I could join. Um, I'm Yvonne um, Rukat Vetter. I'm a change management um, consultant, change leadership advocate. I'm based in Toronto, or well, real Toronto, because I work out of Toronto and Oakville as well. Um, I do change management, um, independent consulting. I also run... Um, it's um, change leadership um, conferences as well as change leadership masterclasses. And um, 
I, my reason for being here today is I really wanted to just you know, be in the midst of um, like-minded people, you know, we're all going through the same things or similar things. And, you know, our passion is all around change and driving change. So to see how we can support each other as a community, as well as learn from each other as a community, as well as brainstorm in terms of how we can even support others at a time like this, because that's what we're all about whether we're doing change leadership or change management, it all comes down to, you know, supporting people as they go through the change process. So supporting ourselves as well as supporting the communities at large and supporting our organizations as well and people we work with. So that's me. Yvonne, I think I met you at Toronto Change Days the yes, year before last. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you, Laurel. How are you? Great. Thanks. <laughs> Very cool. I thought your name was familiar too, because I, I I live in Oakville too, um, oh. and, and I follow the uh, uh, the change leadership on Twitter. Okay. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, Jason, I follow you. Yes. <laughs> I see you. I also follow. I follow you on my personal account as well. So we've seen, cool. seen a lot of stuff you've been doing. So great work. Cool. Awesome. All right, Elizabeth. How about you? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm Elizabeth. I'm from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, I do work as a business consulting, project management, and change management. And uh, well, I have some clients which are facing big challenges now. And I, of course, this will increase my abilities to. The idea is to increase my abilities to help them to go through these big change. Uh, some of them are working on uh, gastronomy and business and they, they had to change to delivery services very, very fast because they had to close their establishments. So, that's why I'm here today. All right, awesome. Uh, and Juniper, so we were just going around the virtual room and everyone was doing a quick uh, introduction of themselves. So who you are, where you're from, and uh, how are you doing and why are you joining today? Hi everybody, um, I'm Juniper, I live in Montreal. Um, and do, 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 I've been following Lean Change um, for about a, a year now, and this was my first opportunity to really um, engage. So I just walked up some stairs. <laughs> um, and my, my job for the past three years has been doing organizational development at Cirque du Soleil. Um, we have been very disrupted by this virus with um, basically all of our operations being shut down. And so I guess I'm here to learn today and looking for community and connections with folks in other industries. Cool. Awesome. All right. So I think um, that we have some awesome topics for Lean Coffee. So I think we can actually accomplish a couple of things. So Sven definitely can do, we'll, we'll run a Lean Coffee remotely using one of my favorite tools. So that would help you see what this tool is like and how it can help. And then we'll do the same with everyone's topics. So I'm just going to share my screen and then I'm going to share the link to the, um, to the Lean Coffee board as well. So everyone should be able to see my screen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is uh, leancoffeetable.com. Um, I've been using this for a few years to do uh, sessions like this um, and been using Lean Coffee for probably close to 10 years or so and a very short description of Lean Coffee. Is Lean Coffee a new term for anyone? Has anybody not done one or? Okay, so the, the quick version of it is um, all Lean Coffees have some type of theme. So any time I've worked with an organization going through any type of organizational change. Uh, Lean Coffee is a really good way to, to gather insights and to, to make sense of what's going on with the people actually affected by the change. So the way it works is uh, you have a theme for your session. And one of the first organizations I used it in, it was for their transformation. So it was uh, put up signs around the building and said, hey, if you have questions about the agile transformation 
or anything related to, to agile practices and all this stuff that we've just started, show up 8.30 every Tuesday in the lounge and we'll do a lean coffee session. So it's designed to be informal and it's designed to help you find people that need help or people who are kind of the early adopters, basically. And people join the session, they write their questions around that theme on sticky notes and then we dot vote. So you put little dots on the stickies and whichever sticky has the most votes is the one that you talk about first. So you set a time box. It could be seven minutes, 10 minutes, usually no more than 10 minutes because it's not designed to solve problems. It's designed as an explore, exploration tool. Sometimes you get solutions out of it. Sometimes you don't. But uh, the expectation is we're going to create some meaningful dialogue about uh, the situation that we're in and what help support you guys need and what we're offering. Uh, after the time box has expired, we use this uh, core protocol consent, which is different from consensus. So consent is that as long as nobody disagrees, we'll move on to the next topic. And then we set a time box for the next voted sticky, the one that had the second highest number of votes, and we continue that process for about an hour or so. This, this tool is very, very good at mimicking it. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, I'm going to open this up. I'm going to share the link in the chat. Uh, so the link is copied. So you should see um, the link pop up in your chat window. Um, Jason, a quick question. Does this still work very well with mobile view? Um, or is it preferable with desktop? It's better for your... In it can work in mobile view as well. It works better on a desktop because then you can do like video chat and the link coffee board at the same time. Okay. And Thank if you, you had to, you, you could do it uh, on mobile. So um, this you can set up to be public. You can set it up to be invite only. Really just depends on, you know, use your best judgment for how to best run the session. So it's going to show, it actually integrates with Zoom as well. So you get everything in one window. So what I want you guys to do is to add your, your topics that you mentioned while you were going through um, introducing yourselves. So you can add the topics there and then everyone will have three votes where they can vote on the topic that um, we want to talk about. So you'll see it kind of, you'll see it update in, in real time as well. I think the one we did last week, we had like 18 topics. So we weren't able to get through all of them in an hour. So a good idea for um, running these remotely is uh, you can also collect some topics ahead of time. Um, you know, if time is is a challenge, so the the link is usually in the meeting invite. So it should have been in the Zoom one as well, uh, but I have multiple different uh, boards, so it might not have come through. Um, so in a real lean coffee session set a time box for how long you want to wait for questions. And it really depends on how many people are, are in the room. Uh, doing this at scale, if you will. So I did one of these with 150 people once and you have them do this exercise at their tables. And uh, I think we had 10, no, we had 15 tables in total. So uh, each table wrote the questions on stickies, they voted at their tables and I said, every table bring up your number one thing to the main wall here. And then when they brought that up, then I brought everybody up to actually vote on those 15 things. So it was just an exercise in how to think about what's the most important thing for us as an entire group of people. So it, it's, you're kind of doing the same process. It's just logistically, it just takes a little bit longer. So now that there's some questions on there, you can go ahead and vote on which ones that you wanted to talk about. Um, there's some other neat things you can do with lean coffee. So if, if you're kind of in a in-person session um, or even remote, if you think there's kind of a status challenge where, you know, sometimes if you're dot voting, the person who, who votes first, especially in person, influences everybody else. So if the boss goes first, people are going to go, oh, I better vote for that one. 
Um, and if the boss goes last, you're going to talk about whatever the boss wants to talk about because they're going to vote for, they're going to be the tiebreaker. So you could say everyone gets three votes. You can't vote for your, your own topic. Or you can do a secret ballot. So I've done things where if we have 10 stickies on the wall, I say write two numbers on a sticky note. So if you wanted to vote for number one and number three on one sticky note, write the number one and the number three on it. And then we just put those up on the wall and it becomes more of a secret ballot kind of idea. So there's some cool ways where, because the intent is meaningful dialogue. It isn't to do communications. Um, it's to have more of a in, informal kind of chat. So votes are coming in. I'll give about another 20 seconds for the votes. Is this a tool that you created, Jason, or is this? Um... No, no, it's, uh, it's 10 bucks for a license per month. Uh, and I think you get unlimited boards. Um, it'll create a summary. You can add comments in real time. So the first time I use this, uh, usually I'm just scribing you know, bullet points of insights that are coming out and then it'll spit out a PDF with all those notes and details. So cool. All Thanks. right. So I'm going to hit the, uh, the magic start discussion button. So it organizes everything by most votes automatically. And we'll go ahead and drag. Come on. I'll drag this into discussing and let's just, let's say seven minutes for this one. That's gonna put a little timer at the top of the thing here. And with Lean Coffee, uh, you always start with the person who added it. So Yvonne, if you wanted to give us a little more, I mean, it's a pretty self-explanatory question, but uh, do you wanna give us a little more context around what you're hoping to get out of the chat? Um, so I'm looking to do some video um, discussions and conversations that I could record and share with others. And um, though I've used Zoom before, I find, okay, <laughs> how do I more effectively, you know, make sure I'm leveraging Zoom? So just generally, even getting people to register to watch some of those sessions or even like some of the stuff you're doing here, it just seems all like, a little bit of magic, <laughs> you know, and, you know, Zoom has now become the tool of choice for some reason or just, you know, it was there before, but I think now everybody's leveraging it. So it's easily accessible. So how do we just use Zoom more effectively, even for ourselves as change consultants to drive discussions, to do videos, to invite people to register, that type of thing? All right, cool. So it's now it's open for uh, for anyone. So has anyone used Zoom quite extensively? I've been using it for three or four years now. Does anybody else have some some good stories about how they're using Zoom? No, I started using Zoom for three or four months ago, not much, and just making meetings. I did not use it yet to for uh, giving classes or things like that. I'm still learning how to work with Zoom. Okay. Um, I had used Zoom also just for meetings. I don't feel myself to be a pro at all. Um, but I was late today because I was facilitating a class for a group of uni 30 university students in South Carolina um, using Zoom. And, um, and also, yeah, led a session on Friday. And I think like a couple of things that have helped me was one, having a co-facilitator that was really on top of the tech. Like I don't feel skilled enough to do it all by myself. And so there's a way that you can have like, a host and a co-host. Um, and so the tech facilitator was putting people in rooms and doing all of that stuff. So that was really helpful for me. Um, and the other thing that's been, um, that I used in both sessions that was helpful was using um, liberating structures methods for doing small group work. Um, and I found that, you know, we use like impromptu networking, which is one where you just put people in pairs with different questions for just a couple minutes and it worked really well. So like we were able to use at least that to make a dynamic. Um, 
but I have super limited experience. Just saying this to support. The <laughs> I mean, saying that is really great because I didn't even think that was possible or know that it was possible. So again, it just goes to show the power of Zoom and the learning curve as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some pretty neat, neat things you can do. Um, so when you do have, uh, when, when my wife does her fitness classes, I'm here in the control room, just making sure people's audio is working and all that type of stuff. So she can't kind of stop in the middle of a, of a routine and do stuff. So there's some neat things you can do uh, when you set the meeting up. If you're expecting a large meeting, you can, um, in your meeting settings, you can automatically mute people on entry. So when you set up your, uh, when you set up your meetings, you've got a bunch of options here. So you can mute people on entry. You can create a waiting room so no one can actually join until the host lets them in. Um, you can leave them wide open or you can have it through authentication. You can put passwords on it, um, et cetera, et cetera. It, uh, it gives you the ability to customize the response email when people register. And it will automatically record as well. So you can record on your computer or uh, on their service and download them. So it's, it's 15 bucks a month for the pro version. The free one, I think they're limiting it to an hour now. It used to be 40 minutes, but I think with the demand, they're letting people use it for an hour for free. So, you know, in this participant list here, I can mute, I can change all those options on the fly. So okay. when I do her classes, I, I get rid of this. So I don't allow partic participants to unmute themselves. Otherwise, you'd hear everybody, everybody's like feet shuffling and talking and hollering and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> you can lock the meeting. So if you don't want to let anybody in, uh, you can do that as well. And then you can actually individually remote uh, mute and camera for people. So some people, mm -hmm. if they've never used it, they don't know how to turn their camera on. So you can just go here and you can say, ask to start camera. Uh, and you can also pin videos. So you might see that in the top right of Zoom, there's a gallery view and a um, speaker view. So you could set it so one person is always on the big screen as well. Uh, the breakout rooms is pretty awesome. So uh, I don't know if I can do a fast enough demo, but... Uh, I'm just gonna I'm gonna just show you what the experience is like quickly. So this will be about 30 seconds. Uh, so break rooms. I'm gonna automatically uh, move you guys into uh, three break rooms, and then you'll be back in like 30 seconds. So you should get a little notification that you're you're being directed into a room, and then you can join. so it'll keep uh, so we're still in the main room so we can still chat Yvonne and then everyone else is still in their uh, breakout rooms so one thing I'll do for this is uh, nice I think the the last one where we had uh, 35 or 40 40 people we ended up just doing like a simulated open space so you could put something in the chat that says, I want to go to breakout room two. And then as a host, I can move you into the room that you want. So you, you have an option to do it automatically or manually. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So it's pretty and, cool. And do you, okay. It says the time is up, you know. So, so well, now I, for lean coffee, we do, we vote if we want to extend this topic or if we want to end it. So you just put in your little thumb vote there. And then, okay, so I think the majority are going to go for extending. So I'll just say for another three minutes, we'll extend this one. Hmm. So it so, resets the timer. So um, I have uh, two recommendations. Uh, the, the first one is uh, to set some rules before you start a meeting. Uh, for example, uh, you can put all on mute. And you can uh, set up uh, the rule that only the people who speak up should uh, um, 
uh, said, uh, or the, the, the others should be on mute and the, and the only one who is talking should, should be uh, open mic. Um, and and rules you usually have in, in your workshops. So that's what I do. If I run a workshop, I, I start with some, some rules. Um, how uh, about trust and so on? But I think uh, we, we need different rules to um, to to be in in the virtual environment or on the digital way. That's the first uh, recommendation, if you will. And the other is. That Zoom is offering a, a bunch of very nice tutorials and trainings and even live trainings. And I joined last week two of them and they were also recorded. So you can even um, look up and, and, uh, and have them. And they explain very nicely the things you started to explain uh, on Zoom. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Are trainings hosted by Zoom or by? Yes, exactly, by Zoom. Zoom is hosting oh. them. And on their homepage, you find very, very interesting ones. And uh, they are free. Um, so. OK, yeah. awesome. And, and Jason, I can circle back with you on this. Do you, use, do you integrate it with Eventbrite? So for instance, can you do recordings and then put them schedule them to go out on event right for people to register and listen to them or is it just directly they just register in zoom and do a webinar i'm just thinking about how to do things like a pre-recording and then have people um, register and it's released to them on that certain date uh, i've done that by using a tool called zapier and zapier is like an automation tool so um when uh, set it up on eventbrite so when people register on Eventbrite, it will automatically add them to a private Zoom meeting. Okay. Yeah. So this way you can make sure that only registered people actually get on the session. Otherwise, you could just put the link to the Zoom, you customize the Eventbrite email, and you could say, you know, here's the link that we're going to go to, but then you can't guarantee that only people who actually registered will show up. You'll probably get some other people that didn't register, especially if it's paid and they just show mm -hmm. up. And if it's lots of people, that'd be hard to manage. And you have a, another choice between meeting and webinar. So there's also a difference uh, between webinar and uh, meetings. Mm, okay, thanks. End or extend, all right. So most for ending, I'll put a couple more of these notes in, in the, the thing as well. So once you end the discussion, uh, it stops the timer, you move it over to discussed, and then we take the next one. So the opportunity. So this was Sonia's opportunities presented by Corona for humanity. So do you want to say a little bit more about that before we start? Uh, well, it was actually um, not even my topic, <laughs> I realized. I just typed it quickly. It was Laurel who, who mentioned it, and, and it's ex actually something I've been uh, thinking about a lot. I'm making a list uh, to um, um, focus on the opportunities that this might present. And yeah, I, I already have a quite extensive uh, list of stuff that I find, uh, I try to find positive and good about this situation. Yeah, and I would be happy to discuss it with you and hear some of your thoughts. Awesome. So, Laurel, did you want to give us a little more information or let, let Sonia go with some of those suggestions? Um, well, maybe just because I put it forward, like, I just, it's really big picture. Like, it really is about humanity. And what got me thinking about it was hearing that there were people in, in Wuhan, for example, seeing blue sky for the first time and I just started to think about like people who have, can see something really good that they've never seen before haven't seen in years like I imagine humanity is going to have a different perspective potentially coming out of this and I guess I just thought if I were someone who had seen blue sky for the first time in years or the first time in my life I, it'd be really hard to not want that going forward. So what does that mean for us as a, as a species, I guess, when we might have conflicting views on 
what we've had and assumed to be okay and now what the world has opened up to us as a different perspective like what how is that going to reconcile that's going to be very interesting um i know everybody's talking or i shouldn't say everybody but most people are beginning to talk about what the new normal is going to be and um I believe this crisis or this pandemic, the time we find ourselves, has shown us what is possible even for us to stop and think, you know. Um, so many things we thought were not possible, <laughs> we're seeing that it is possible to do it, you know. So it definitely will be interesting to see whether as soon as all this is over, are people going to want to go back to how things were before? Or are people going to really see this as an opportunity to reset? And when you talk about blue skies, Laura, one of the things that comes to my mind is the re why weren't they seeing blue skies before? Was it because, you know, of the policies that were in place by the government or the leadership or people who were in rule and what they saw as priority for the, um, themselves or the environment? And... Um, I'm beginning to see that leadership is going to play a very big role in what the new normal is, whether and the type of rule, um, the type of leaders we have, and what they want for their people. And are they going to now start to say, let's focus more on the environment? Are the leaders in China going to say, let's start to focus on the environment? So are they just going to be quick to go back to production and go back to the same things that caused this to be the same as before? So I feel that leadership is going to really play a big role in what happens going forward. That's what I personally think. Yeah, it's a good point, right? Because you look at how leadership right now of every different constituency, whether it's a city or a province or a, a, a country, um, like every country is managing this in different, like managing the COVID-19, the coronavirus in different ways. And, and getting somewhat different results. Um, and it, yeah, so leadership in the moment is important, but yeah, I love that, that point, like leadership going forward, the, the receptiveness, the openness to changing trajectories could be amazing. Um, and that conversation that's gonna have to happen across leaders of various um, global constituencies is, is it's just gonna be really interesting to see how honest and um, innovative they're going to allow themselves and each other to be at that table. Yeah, totally agree with you. And just a simple base example that we see all the time is working from home. Some organizations do not encourage working from home. They don't like people working from home and they haven't even set people to work from home. So you find that some people have just lost their jobs by virtue of the fact that that organization was not even set up for people to work from home. So in a situation like that, what's the culture gonna go, to, go back to or continue with when we all have to go back to work? Are we gonna to continue to work from home or not? Or it's back to normal? I think it's the uh, the it's going to be the stance of the the leader. If I put that in air quotes, um, uh, doing so much remote work with teams <clears throat> in an agile context over the years, you know, uh, even for organizations that have one office, the uh, they usually teams will take care of this in their team agreements. So you can work from home whenever you want, but Tuesday from ten until two is our sprint planning. So everybody be in the office. And the people that are doing the delivery work create their own team agreements and team norms around it. And the company is agnostic from that decision. Um, a friend of mine, she, uh, she's a paralegal. And uh, even with the courts closed, the boss of the firm that she was working for demanded, you know, everybody has to be here. And they were all sick and, and coughing. I don't think any of them were, uh, are infected, but still the view of that leader was, if you're not here, you're not working, as far as I'm concerned. 
Exactly. Yeah. Those, are, those are things that I'm taking it back to mm -hmm. humanity. Those are the kind of things you need to start to, um, going back to the whole work life balance. Is there, is there even such a thing as work life balance? Mm. You know, and people, so some people will see opportunity to say, you know what? So maybe I don't really need this office space. And I can give somebody back their travel time of one hour or two hours if they can work more effectively from home. But it's going to be the leadership mindset again that is going to push back to, do I want my people where I can see them? Or really, let's be deliverable focused. And as long as I'm seeing the deliverables, people have more time to their family. I also think there's now going to be more of a demand for families where they see the value. Some of them who have families, you know, see the value of, spending time more at home with their family and their children and their spouses and partners. And they will start to think maybe this is what I need more of. Mm -hmm. So it will also cause a mind shift for some people. So even if the leader is not changing anything, maybe people in their individual um, lives would say, you know what, maybe I want something different for myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just, just uh, what I did, uh, I, I put a link to an interesting article from a very famous German uh, researcher for future, or visionaire. So if you have time, uh, he is looking in the, in the autumn or in September of this year, uh, uh, what's, what might happen after mm -hmm. Corona. So it's, mm. I think it's interesting to, to get some new ideas and feelings. I think people are going to realize too, that they have a lot more choice. You know, there's a lot of, um, you know, with the, you could call it panic over being locked down and being, uh, being at home. I, uh, I don't think people were upset about that. They're, they're upset about the, the removal of choice and not feeling that they have a choice to, to go outside or not go outside. And I think that pressure, um, you know, for workers, whatever that means, uh, they have a lot more control and flexibility than they think. Because I meet so many people that feel stuck where they're at and they think, well, I have to because of. And events like this get people to wake up to realize that, well, maybe the way things are now aren't the way that they need to be. And there is choice. There are options. Um, you know, I've been working globally for She's easily six, seven years, and most of my work is outside of North America because there is no, the globe is the sandbox. Um, there's no limitation on who you can work with, where you can work with, or how you do it. And it's just a matter of people realizing that there is a lot more choice out there. You don't have to be stuck in a place that you don't want to be stuck in. Um, there's a jiggle that needs to happen to get people to realize that th I think they have a lot more control than they might think. Mm. The other thing that I think um, for myself, also with the huge simplification of my life, getting laid off with 96% of my company a couple weeks ago, realizing the choices I have, even when I feel like I don't have choice and the way that the space has like opened up my life um, to be like on a call like this, for example, it's, I'm, I'm like, wow, this, this space is so valuable to me. And then... The other thing I'm really noticing discussions about, at least in my communities, is about the kinds of work that are perhaps undervalued in terms of pay, like um, all of the now essential services that we're seeing and how do we um, look at our economy to value what is essential, whether it's nurses who are very low paid or folks doing food service or those kind of things. and. Um, yeah, what do we value in our economy? I, I hope we can keep thinking about that together. And also how we build safety nets, like going back to different countries, dealing with it differently, just seeing like how grateful I am being in Canada, having a safety net for myself and others. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wonder how much of that's a North American thing. Because I, 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 I spent just the, uh, um, the undervaluing of essential services. Because uh, I, I spend a lot of time in the Nordics and it's completely opposite. Uh, from my perspective there, there's a lot of emphasis on anyone who does service type of work. And it's not perfect. No, no place is. But I think the North American stance just has this, especially stuff coming, you know, more so maybe out of the US that the emphasis is always on making the most money, getting the highest title, and stuff that doesn't necessarily matter as much as humanity sometimes. 
I think that comes down to the Maslow, uh, Maslow's law of hierarchy. It's where you are on the needs um, pyramid, you know, um, once people have a certain need satisfied, they move to the next level. So where we are as a country, where certain things, we, take, we easily take certain things for granted because of the availability of it. So we keep on moving to the next level or up or down based on where our needs are. And right now we're at a place where the biggest need we have, sorry, I think I'm, um, um, we're at a place where the biggest need we have is around the services and we're beginning to value it. I made a comment, um, somebody did post something around there in terms of service staff and the value and feeling it was a little bit of hypocrisy that people were now valuing nurses and teachers and all of that. And I said, I don't think it's hypocrisy. I think it's just human behavior. We don't realize what we have until we don't have it. So people mm. are now beginning to realize this value. And I wouldn't be surprised if for a while we value it and then we shift back to not valuing it again. And, you know, when we go back to the new normal and we, we all go back to, oh, I haven't worked football. Thank football. You go back to, you know, focusing on football and entertainment and all of this. It's just needs, you know. Mm -hmm. So where there's a bigger value for something, that's where the focus is. Where you find people focus, there's a lot of poverty. People will focus on food and the government and how they can support them. And where people have all of those things, they, they change to another level of need. So I think what we're seeing is real Maslow's law in place. Mm -hmm. And we need to follow the process. So there's 23 seconds left in the timer. <laughs> uh, Lean Coffee yeah. gives you the ability to extend right in the session as well. I don't know. And to if uh, if we're done, we're done. And then we just move it over to the right. And then I think we can... We'll have a good enough time box for one more uh, topic, the best way to support organizations. Awesome. Um, so Yvonne, anything more to say about that one? So that was one that you added. Oh gosh, me again. Um, <laughs> uh, every time I move away from the video, it changes it. Um, for me is, um, I just felt that this was a good time and if we as independents or whether we're full-time or we're within any organization we're working at the moment um how do we show value at this time how do we lead from the middle to show how um value that we can how we can support them because we're all about leading and managing change so there's no better time like this to show the value that we're supposed to provide. I know we've long, long been in that place of, you know, tactical change management. Where is do your assessments, um, you know, um, do your analysis, do your change strategy, do your change plan, communication training, you know, all of those kind of things. But there's a more inherent value that we can provide to help lead, lead and drive change. So how do we provide that type of value now? How do we show how valuable we can be at this time? I think this gives us a really good opportunity to have the conversation around unknowable unknowns um, and complexity theory. Uh, Stacy, Ralph Stacy, Dave Snowden, uh, stuff that has been talked about you know, in agile circles for uh, a couple of decades around, uh, we live in an unpredictable world but we strongly desire to have predictability, but we know we can't when we really think about it. And I think we have a, a really good frame to have that discussion around continual sense-making and nobody wants the plan. They want the act of planning to mm -hmm. give them clarity around where we're headed. And uh, same with communication. Nobody wants to communicate at people because we know it doesn't work, but we're able to, to, to move more towards meaningful dialogue or move towards um, how to work on reducing uncertainty instead of, you know, Agile has said a lot around we need to embrace uncertainty. So it's kind of like jumping off a cliff and hoping there's a mattress or water down there, which isn't what it is. It's more about how do we, how do we work on reducing it? How do we do um, 
you know, Canadian government does updates every morning. Here's the, here's the new things that we've learned and here's what we're doing. Mm. And, and they said, um, what did she say? She said, uh, right now, speed over perfection is the most important. We take in as mm. much data as we can. We make a good enough decision because it's not possible to make it perfect. And we know it's going to change tomorrow. And then, of course, the anti-government reporters say, well, why didn't you plan this 10 years ago? You're always going to have people that will say things like that. But that's not how the world has ever worked. And I think now we're realizing it that, you know, we, we can't afford to, you know, spend months working on a change plan. Well, maybe in some contexts you can. Like banks, their, their horizon for change is always going to be a long tail. Any... Uh, if I can find the article, I'll post it in here, but there's a really good um, chart from uh, HBR that talks about uh, different markets. So when you look at stable industries like uh, rubber, for example, tires, we're always going to have to move things from A to B. That's what's called a, a durable market. It's n likely to never go away until we invent like hovercrafts and stuff. Um, so transforming those organizations will always take on a certain personality of change theater, if you will. They'll make process improvements, but it won't be deep, meaningful stuff. When you get into consumer goods, where it's kind of kill or be killed attitude, the attitude towards change is totally different in that avenue. Um, pharmaceuticals, the attitude for change is totally different there. So they outline these four different um, types of markets and industries that are more susceptible to disruption and why their approach for change needs to be uh, more contextualized for their environment. So is that not where organizations need to have a culture of change and be change fit, which is something they push back against? When I say change fit in the sense that people need to be constantly open to change and how they're changing, the biggest thing we get um, or I see is where people are like, oh, too much change, change fatigue, you know, and is that often because it's a culture where they're not open to change? So what role does culture play in how people respond to and prepare for change? Or even where you see one of the operational processes often talked about is business continuity planning. And business continuity planning, as simple as it is, is for a time like this, what happens in a time of disaster? So some organizations to, uh, have taken that seriously. Some organizations haven't taken that seriously. So it comes down to preparing to be able to respond to changes such as this. Again, that's maybe where there's going to be a mindset, a mindset shift. There's going to be a culture shift for organizations. There's going to be learning afterwards. So do we play a role now in, again, come to how do we play a role now in supporting our organizations? So how do we start to think of how we we um, up our skill sets as consultants or change people to support organizations going forward. So the, the link is in the chat as well. So I found that, that same article if you're interested in reading that. Oh, and you're, okay, down, to, you're down to two free articles now in HBR. Okay, it used to be five. I know. They, it's they, brutal. They changed they, it like this month, I think. So, so anyway, <laughs> you can just use a, a VPN. So if you go to freevpn.com or uh, I can't remember what it is, then it will look like you're from a different place and then you can just unlimited, just switch your IP. And you'll think you're somebody else. <laughs> that this, yeah, that paywall is a great example of having no clue about how complex systems work because it's so easy to game these types of systems. The more we try to control, the more likely we get the opposite effect. Um, mm -hmm. Dave Snowden tells this awesome story around uh, the company he was working for. Uh, Dave, Dave Snowden created the uh, Canavan model, co-created it, and it's about uh, complexity science and how uh, it's easy to say in hindsight, we should have done this, but you couldn't have predicted that in the first place. So he tells a story around um, his company was acquired by IBM and his company used to buy like snacks and stuff like that for all the employees. And IBM's policy was thou shalt not buy any snacks for people. So the managers of, of his company realized that if you over tipped cab drivers, they would give you blank taxi receipts. So they would hand in fake taxi receipts to get money back for buying snacks. 
So what con more control was brought in actually got the opposite effect. Um, and this was like 20 years ago at the talk. So he does this in the talk. He says, while he's doing the talk, I gave this talk last week and I had two people from IBM come to me afterwards and they still have blank taxi receipts in their wallet. They're like, did you create that process? So you get this kind of our desire to overly control and constrain a system makes it fragile and it breaks very easily. I think this, um, this, this is a really good, good article that touches a little bit on those, those dynamics. But Do you have any yeah. um, suggestions for an intro to Dave Snowden's work? Like to dip a toe in? Yes, uh, it is. Um, this is great. So many resources on this call. Uh, there we go. I, I show this one in my change class. It's like a three minute video. Um, I'll just get the link and then pause it. And he explains complexity in the context of a children's party. And it's a riot. It's an absolute riot to listen to, but it's just a clinic in how um, the foundation of the idea is enabling constraints versus governing constraints. An enabling constraint would be your budget has $10,000, do whatever you want with it. A governing constraint is you need approval for every you know, candy bar that you buy and it has to go through this complex approval process, even though the budget is still 10,000. So yeah, this, this video is just awesome uh, to watch, but we're, uh, we're, we're up at the 11 o'clock hour. Um, I'm fine to stay on and chat for a bit, but I know other people might have uh, meetings that they have to, to run off to. So um, I'll stick around and chat. The video recording will be up and I'll do an output of the notes in the lean coffee table. And uh, thanks for taking the time this morning. This was awesome. Um, I'm going to get into a rhythm of doing these every Monday at 10 for North American European uh, audiences. And then probably Tuesday nights will be, uh, you know, lean beer slash lean coffee. So lean beer for here <laughs> and then lean coffee for the folks in Asia Pacific. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Um, I can hang on for a little bit more if I'm not taking anybody's time. would love to learn a little bit more about um, connecting Zapier and um, Eventbrite and Zoom. I mean, I'm starting to do that. Um, but it'll be, it could be one or two questions I want to ask. So except anybody has any other question, I'll just wait. Okay. I, I'm going to step off, but Jason, I was just wondering, are you running any um, online courses? I'm just wondering, is the online course run as like a cohort or can you start any time? I do both. So there's self-study where you do it your own pace, get access for a year, um, and then you get support, like real-time support through Slack and through monthly calls. And the cohort is uh, eight hours of online sessions. So you get access to all the exact same stuff as the self-study. And then we do, um, I had been doing one-hour sessions for 16 weeks because people just couldn't dedicate more time. With real jobs, I'm doing an hour and a half twice a week for... I guess three weeks um, for the cohorts and that's for both. Yep. Cool. Yep. All right. Thank you. This was so lovely. So lovely to meet all of you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Nice awesome. Thanks. Yeah. I uh, sorry. I just have one question about the software you used. Um, mm -hmm. uh, this is on your uh, site and uh, or c how can I use it in our company? So that's my question now. Oh, lean coffee table. Yes, this lean it, coffee table. Yeah, it's public. It's just like uh, like Zoom, anything like that. Just go to leancoffeetable.com. So I have it, and yeah, well, it's it's public. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah, you can uh, put constraints on it too, so you can only do invitation only and passwords and and a bunch of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Is that is that something you developed, lean coffee table? Nope. Oh, it's out there. Okay. Nope. I used to do it with uh, Google Drive and it just became so difficult. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the question I had is just to give you an idea. Thank you. Bye bye. It was a pleasure meeting you. In, uh, uh, so let me know if you are in Germany. Um, uh, it would be a pleasure to meet you. Um, so let me know. I was supposed to in May, so I was I was in, going in to May. be I was going to be in Warsaw, and then I was going to try to do something in Berlin while I was relatively close. But I think that's uh, all going to be uh, canceled and remote. But uh, yeah, maybe next year. Yeah, yeah. So or the fall. See. Yeah. Or the fall. Yes. Switzerland in the fall. So maybe I'll try and piggyback a trip if that if that still goes through.
Okay, great. Great. All right. Thank you very, very much. So it was a big pleasure and I learned a lot. Bye-bye. Yep. So, um, Jason, so what I'm trying to do is I want to do some pre-recordings of, um, um, mm -hmm. however, I not live webinars. So I want to pre-record a video and then get people to register. And then when they register, um, at the certain time, they get the links. So, and it could be a series. So every time a new release comes out, they automatically get the link once they registered. I know Eventbrite does something like that, mm -hmm. where it asks you to put the recording so at a certain time it to release it. So I'm looking for one-time registration. You register one time and um, for the series and, you know, every, and once it's done, every time a new video is released, you receive that. Um, video. Is that something you're familiar with? I know I've been trying to read that process. Is that something you're familiar with? There's a few ways to do it. I To do that, I use um, something called thinkific.com. Okay, so you do that as more as an online course. Yeah, so you could do subscription-based, whereas uh, basically they have like a, a drip settings option where you can add all of your content and then put in those time the times when you want to release them. So people sign up through uh, Thinkific and they get access to whatever has been unlocked. So, um, you know, example would be if somebody signs up six months from now, they should get everything or they should get time released content. Um, Thinkific, if, Thinkific does it fairly easily. Uh, YouTube has the ability to do this with channels as well. So mm. uh, you can set up um, like private content uh, using uh, uh, patreon.com basically mm. so you so you give people early access to certain things before it comes public so if you eventually want to make them public that's another option mm. uh, with eventbrite uh, uh, so if you had like 10 videos you'd have 10 eventbrite events yeah, so um, I don't know because um, that's the thing I want to check whether it's going to be a series where it releases at a different time. So still, you know, exploring it. Mm -hmm. And for all of the thing, um, thing typical or even um, you've spoken about, um, you can still use Zoom as a recording. So when you record in Zoom, so Zoom allows you to save it on your laptop. Does yeah. it also host it online, whereby yeah. you can just share a link? Yeah. Uh, so if I go in, let me just share my screen again, I'll show you. I think I still have a couple of recordings up there. Uh, so you, you can accomplish the same thing with Zoom. Cause, so you create a meeting. So if I'm going to schedule a new meeting, oh, actually they're already up there. So these are all the, uh, the fitness classes mm. the Wi-Fi set up. So uh, these are all up on our website. So they're all separate meetings. They automatically start at that day and time and no one can get in there. Uh, until those start and then the recordings will show up here and you can just share the links or you can actually download the audio and the video files. So if you wanted to turn these into like audio podcasts, you could do that as well because it will give you, I think, um, uh, the chat transcript, anything that people type in the chat, it will give you uh, video with audio and just audio. Okay, so that's interesting. So are you saying that for the meetings that you, um, the, the classes your wife hosts is she has it, she's already done the video and then she, for that scheduled time when people book that meeting, so if they book to attend a session, they don't see that video until that specific time that the meeting has been set. Oh, she does hers live. The meetings, oh, live. the meetings are scheduled, but they're live. So if they weren't live and she pre-recorded them, then it would be the same type of idea with just a link to the uh, the recording. Okay, so how? Yep. Okay, so I think that's what I want to do because I want to use um, Zoom to do the recording, but mm -hmm. at that set time, I would like instead of a live meeting or webinar, I would just like them to be able to see the recording. Okay. Hmm. Is that what you're saying she does or? Uh, she does them all live. Uh, just the, okay. meeting, the meetings are scheduled in advance. So people will get the, um, the email notification, click here to join the class and then they join in real time. So okay. for yours, it would be, you, they're just looking at the actual recording. Mm. Uh, so if you pre-recorded them ahead of time, you can do 
maybe their webinar option would work for that. Mm, okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like things things. WordPress or YouTube would probably work better for pre-recordings because you could do the same with uh, with WordPress, just time released content. Mm. Tied yeah, into okay. registrations. I'll I'll explore that. Thank you very much. Yeah.